Do you have the other one pinned to you? I have the other one here. I think they said they yes. just said for So the uh, we have two microphones for the presenters. And uh, the reason for that is that one is going to the stream and one is going to the AV and recording. So there's two different feeds that we need for both. So when you come up, just so you know, we're going to pin one to you and then you'll use the other mic to speak, even though it's kind of easy here. It's not going to be picked up with the recording. Uh, so welcome to the uh, abstract presentation for a came. And uh, our first presenter uh, from SUNY Downstate is uh, Roshnak Banaba. And she's going to be talking about the utility of two Uh Hi, everybody. I keep pressing on this. There should be a green light. OK. You got it? I can, yep, I think so. <laughs> I think so, but let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, I also have a very loud voice, so I can just shout. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, my name is Roshan Ekbanabas. I am a PGY1 emergency medicine resident here at SUNY Downstate. I am going to talk about a systematic review and meta-analysis that we did on utility of 2-PAM in organophosphate poisoning. The investigators don't have anything to disclose. A little bit about what and why. Why is this important? Uh, so organophosphates belong to a larger group of compounds current, uh, called organophosphorus, which is in that group there are organophosphates, which are mostly used as pesticides or as components of pesticides, uh, carbamate, and also uh, nerve gas or ner nerve agents. Uh, organophosphate was first developed in like 1930s and has been around as uh, pesticides in the United States since 1970s to early 2000s when they uh, started banning or at least restricting some of the more potent organophosphates because of the risk of poisoning, but still some of the co organophosphate uh, components are still available in the United States as well. Uh, but in lower and uh, middle in mid-income countries, they're still being used vastly, even the more potent one, even the more dangerous ones. And uh, WHO actually estimates that uh, there is around 3 million cases of poisoning per year in these countries, both intentional and accidental. Uh, and there is more than 200,000 uh, deaths per year uh, around the world from organophosphate poisoning. They have also been used as the, the same family has also been used uh, as gas agent, as as late uh, as, late as uh, 2017, allegedly, in Syria. And they have also been used by terrorist group as kind of a, um, it, the, the most famous one is 1995 in uh, Tokyo subway. So it's very important to know about them, no matter where you are practicing uh, and which, which of these scenarios you will be dealing with. Uh, so a little bit about how they work. Uh, so in a normal situation, oh. What did I do? In a normal um, situation, acetylcholine gets released from the presynaptic neuron uh, and then uh, attaches to the, uh, the, um, to the receptor in the postsynaptic neuron and uh, leads to a signal transmission. Uh, in a normal situation, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase gets rid of the extra acetylcholine after it has already uh, attached to the receptor and that, that is how the neurotransmission ends. Uh, what uh, organophosphates do is that they deactivate this enzyme, acetylcholine esterase, and therefore there is a lot of acetylcholine that accumulates in the synapsis and overstimulation of the postsynaptic neuron, and that causes the, uh, the symptom signs and symptoms that we are going to be talking about uh, in the next slide. Uh, but just as we are here, I want to also talk about how medications that are used to treat organophosphate uh, poisoning work because they also use the same... Uh, basically mechanism. Uh, the mainstream of treatment is atropine. So atropine, what it does is that it uh, competes with the acetylcholine that is now accumulated in the synapses and basically competes uh, with it at the receptors. That's the mainstream of treatment. There's another treatment, an adjunct treatment called 2PAM, which we're going to talk about, uh, which what it does is that it theoretically, it reactivates the acetylcholine esterase enzyme. The reason I say theoretically because it has only been uh, been studied in vitro and therefore in lab and therefore there has been like recent data showing that it might not be as useful clinically. Um, okay, so there's basically the same thing. So uh, the, uh, the result of that acetylcholine uh, uh, basically accumulating in the synapses causes this uh, cholinergic toxiderome which is 
uh, the mnemonic sludge we learned about in uh, medical school, at least I learned about in medical school, uh, salivation, lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, gastrointestinal distress, emesis, uh, and also the, mo the more feared, uh, basically, uh, symptoms of bronchorrhea, bronchoconstriction, bradycardia, uh, and also there are nicotinic uh, effects in muscle fasciculation, weakness, and also CNS effects. There is also intermediate syndrome, which is, happens in 48 to 96 hours after the, um, after the cholinergic toxiderome, which respiratory paralysis, uh, cranial neuropathy, uh, neuropathy and proximal uh, limb weakness. Uh, I just have to say here, this picture, this is not my drawing. This is from uh, um, the website Academic Life in Emergency Medicine. I just thought it's a good, basically, summary of all the signs and symptoms. Uh, so, uh, so the reason we did this study was basically to see this adjunct therapy, this 2-PAM that we add to atropine, is it really clinically uh, needed or not, or does it ha um, is it needed or not, basically? So we looked at all the randomized control trials that were done using uh, randomizing patients uh, with acute organophosphate uh, poisoning to uh, atropine uh, plus 2-PAM versus atropine plus placebo to see if this 2-PAM actually has any uh, additive, uh, basically, uh, benefit. So our primary outcome was death, uh, mortality. The secondary outcomes were need for intubation, duration of intubation, uh, complications rate, which was mostly pneumonia, and intermediate syndrome. Uh, we searched up to March of 2017, and uh, for data analysis, uh, we pulled the risk ratios for all of them, except for duration of intubation, which we used mean difference. Uh, so we found five studies with almost 600 patients. All of them were RCTs and all of them were in English language, but most of them, uh, the data was coming from uh, lower and middle income countries, but uh, the paper itself was in English. That we did not include non-English uh, literature. So the primary outcome mortality, if you, um, if you look at here, the risk ratio uh, is 1.54, but if you look at the 95% uh, confidence interval, it crosses one, which basically means that between the two groups, the groups that got 2PAM versus those who didn't, there was no, uh, no difference in terms of mortality. Uh, we found the same results um, for, risk, for int risk of intubation. There was no difference in duration of intubation. Uh, the same thing for intermediate syndrome, and there was no change in complications between the two groups. Uh, the only thing is that for some of the outcomes, like um, risk of intubation and intermediate syndrome, uh, the risk ratio doesn't pass one, but it still includes one, which basically, um, if we can't say there is no difference, but we can't say also there is a difference. So basically, it should be taken into account that it might be, uh, for these outcomes also, it might be the same between the two groups. Uh, so in conclusion, our systematic review did not really find any strong evidence supporting the, at least the routine use of 2PAM, uh, but uh, why this is important, the reason this is important is that you might think if 2PAM is as good as placebo, well, let's give it to everybody. The problem is that 2PAM is an expensive medication, and especially in these countries, lower and middle income countries, it can be a financial burden on their health system. Uh, but there are limitations to our systematic review. We only uh, looked at English literature. There might be a ton of non-English literature out there that, that we missed. Uh, we, did not, um, we did not do a, like a cost analysis. We did not look at the actual cost that this puts on uh, the medical system. We did not look at carbamate or nerve agents because those are out of the scope of this uh, systematic review. We only looked at organophosphate, which are mostly in pesticides. And also our outcomes were mostly uh, dichotomized, so basically for, um, for death, for need for intubation, for complication rate, uh, these are mostly like um, yes and no. So we did not look at uh, if, it's, um, prol if it prolongs or shortens the, the length of a stay or if it uh, changes the, basically the, um, the course of hospital stay. Uh, when we talked to some of the experts from our department that have actually worked with these patients, they said that in their experience, there are other benefits to 2PAM, such as it, you may need to give less atropine when you add 2PAM to it. We did, we did not find that in literature, but that was like expert experience that uh, was told to us. Uh, these are the authors, um, and also these are my references. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any
there any questions? It, this is very important because it's, it's sort of a dogma that has been going on for like dozens of years. And it, it's all protocols, all SOPs, and mm -hmm. uh, it probably needs to be looked at closely in a relevant, in a relevant prospective study. Um, yes. It has a huge impact on, on both operations and cost. So far, there have been five RCTs, all of them good quality RCTs. None of them have found, like the, the pool data does not show any benefit for yeah, two pairs. Mm -hmm. uh, not much. The only thing that I would say we didn't, we could not account for, and these studies did not provide us with is that we took, um, they all of them enrolled patients with acute organophosphate poisoning. We did not have uh, access to patient level data to see how comparable these uh, patients are. But in systematic reviews, when we do the meta-analysis, usually we have uh, things in uh, statistics like I-score to look at it and see if the data is all over the place or can we actually pull it. And, in, and the data was pretty homo homogeneous. Your I-squared was 42%, yes. which is uh, acceptable for, for Yes, for most of, we did not pull, uh, it, it was in our protocol that we, we do not pull the data if I-score is more than 50%. Mm -hmm. So for all the outcomes, the I-score was less than 50% mm -hmm. when we pulled the data. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Annalisa Wolf. Our next speaker is Dr. Annalisa Wolf, uh, who comes to us from Louisiana uh, at LSU. Uh, she's going to be speaking on development and implementation of first aid response in Haiti. Here, maybe. Here. Thank you. Thanks. There you go. Thank you. Hi, so I'm based in New Orleans, but this work is with eMedics International, which is actually housed here at Downstate, although we're starting to scatter. I have no conflicts to disclose. So eMedics has been working in the Northeast region of Haiti for about a decade. Um, it's one of the poorest regions in the Western Hemisphere. Um, having worked there for a while, we've had the opportunity to do quite a bit of work looking at what emergency cases ha happen, who presents to the hospital, and how they get there. Um, namely, many people get there by foot or via a professional driver, like a motorcycle taxi. And um, we've also done some capacity assessments of the local healthcare facilities, um, including the clinics and the hospitals, and have noticed that resources are very limited and that's largely infrastructure so electricity road access can be significant barriers to emergency care so emedics is focused on working on improving emergency care access and quality um, because of all the infrastructure problems and all of the the resource limitations, our desire and our, our plan was to bring capacity building to the communities themselves. Um, so we piloted a train the trainer pr framework to get um, trainers who can teach first responder tr skills. So a key to every part of this was our long-term partnerships. So we had partners who helped us come up with the curriculum, um, make sure that it was appropriate for the setting, um, look at the, the manual, help with the teaching, and do ongoing monitoring and evaluation. Um, also important is the fact that most of us are emergency care doctors. Lots of us have pre-hospital care experience. Many of us have worked in Haiti already, so have a little familiarity with the topic. Um, and then throughout, we really focused on trying to get meaningful feedback from our community members, what works, what doesn't work, and how can we move forward and make this better. So th this is a two-part pro project. Um, the first part was we taught a first aid curriculum to our, our volunteers and um, taught them 
using locally sourced materials so that we wouldn't be dependent on stuff coming from the outside. So like sticks and fabric and rice bags and bamboo. Um, it was very skills and hands-on oriented. Um, and we developed a manual that we had translated into Haitian Creole. We then followed that with teaching workshops where we worked with our trainers extensively to get them to learn how to teach this information and do it in an effective way. Um, and we made them practice a lot. And then we realized we needed to do also quite a few review sessions and so that was added at an ad hoc basis. So part two was our trainers, our newly trained trainers who are geographically diverse, uh, dispersed within the region, started doing trainings themselves. So we grouped them in groups of four to seven trainers. Um, we supervised them until they were ready to fly on their own. Um, and they recruited community members. And based on our previous research on the fact that many professional drivers bring people to the hospital, they especially recruited drivers. Um, and then we evaluated the trainers using predefined criteria. And once they m met that criteria, they graduated and then they were able to receive a per diem. So um, of the train, the trainers, the, we, our partners had nominated people to be volunteers, um, they, if, to be in the training. About half of them finally went through the almost two year process to be graduated. Um, they were slightly predominantly female, mean age of 44, and about 61% had previous healthcare training, often um, like community health worker. And um, when we surveyed them, um, immediately after the first training and then six months later when they realized how arduous they would be, we were surprised to find that everybody still wanted to be in it. Um, 12 months later, the phone survey feedback was that that the curriculum was relevant to local emergencies and um, we did also get the feedback that most people weren't confident to run the, this course by themselves. So we worked with that. Um, and then at six months out, 45% of the trainers who ultimately finished the training said that they had, been used, had actually used their skills taught in a clinical situation. So, by December of 2015, which is the time reported, the trainings had trained 270 community members. Most of those, there was a male predominance, the mean age was 31, and um, a, about a quarter of them were professional drivers. When we followed up with them, we were able to get in touch with 121 of them. About a third of them said they had used their skills, and 20% said that they had actually transported people to the hospital. Um, and we also found that people who were actually drivers were more likely with the odds ratio of 2.3 to have delivered first aid care. So this is always, there's always many challenges in working internationally in a different language and culture. Um, one of our significant challenges was trying to figure out a way to test knowledge. And we found that particularly in a setting where a lot of our trainers had limited literacy, that tests were very, very difficult. Even when read out loud in Haitian Creole, the act of, and made anonymous, the act of circling and answering questions was really stressful for people and we found it to be not, not correlating with people's skills. Um, we also, in order to do surveys, ended up having to usually have a Haitian staff member make phone calls, and so there's, that introduces some, time, some areas for bias. Um, and then teaching, we got feedback from our, from our participants that said that the use of, of translators to help us initially do the trainings was effective, but we found it was super helpful to have our Haitian partners present because they motivated people, they inspired people, and they were able to help kind of culturally adapt some of the messaging and language. So another problem is how do we go from a program that we are giving people a per diem and we're funding them to um, people becoming volunteers and, do, and volunteering their time to train and volunteering their time to take the training, especially um, drivers gave the feedback that it was hard for them to give up a day of earning to be there. And this is, remember, a place where people are kind of scrabbling together a, 
a living wage. And then in the context of a country that has been very much influenced by foreign aid and money and aid organizations, um, how much do you pay a person and how do you figure that out and how do you not throw the local economy out of whack and how do you do this responsibly? Um, these were challenges for us. So um, what we think are strengths are being able to take advantage of local resources, so um, using the materials that are available and then using our human resources. So our trainers became the, their local experts in their own villages and um, the drivers started functioning in some ways as a de facto EMS system, which we were really proud of and seemed like a good example of task shifting. So we're in work with the EMS system that's starting to develop to try to collaborate and hopefully one day link our dispatch and have everybody working together. And um, we're hoping to continue developing our trainers and participants. So, and we had so much help <laughs> from so many people. So we're thankful for that. <laughs> Questions? So have you checked with how many of these people that you train, that you train are still like actively engaged doing what they're, they're doing? Is it far enough out that you can check that out? Or? Yeah, so, um, when we go back, we get in touch with some of our lead trainers to see what's happening. I think one of the things that we're finding a challenge is without us giving an ongoing per diem and giving that trigger to do the training, it's hard for people to, to take that initiative. Once we suggest it, everyone's on board, but it's just we all are busy people in northern Haiti as well. So we're, that's something we're still working with them, and that's why we're hoping ultimately if we link in with our existing what's developing as an EMS system that hopefully will add some motivation to continue to working, to work. Always a challenge. <laughs> so much for being here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the Stop the Bleed program and how we have implemented it in our institution. Um, I'm a trauma and surgical ICU nurse at New York Presbyterian uh, Wild Cornell. So Stop the Bleed is um, basically, uh, it's a program designed to teach basic hemorrhage control techniques to members of the public, so people with no healthcare background. It was developed by the ACS in response to the Sandy Hook shooting. So. Um, why is this important? Why is it important for our communities to learn these things? So there's the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, the Pulse nightclub shooting, the Las Vegas concert shooting, um, and then in New York City in the past two years we've had a few uh, terrorist acts and accidents um, where vehicles will actually drive up onto the sidewalk pinning pedestrians um, and injuring and killing them. So in all of these events, um, people died from bleeding, um, and people died quickly, and a lot of people died. And so the, the idea behind Stop the Bleed is to bring the skills to people who may not have any experience in healthcare to be able to intervene in those critical minutes after someone's injured and potentially give that person a little bit higher of a chance to get to the hospital. So we wanted to bring these skills out to hopefully have more people live through these events, because unfortunately in this world, these things keep, you know, keep happening at a higher frequency, so we, we wanted to prepare our community to respond if there was the need. So our goal was to engage and train the public, um, as many members of the public as we could in our community on the basic hemorrhage control techniques that were taught in Stop the Bleed. Um, and we also wanted to assess their, their knowledge prior to and after the course to make sure that we were teaching them effectively in a way that they
um, I found to be the most useful part of it for the participants because they can actually practice on the models. Um, we have people practicing tourniquets on each other, on themselves, um, to really get a good feel um, and have that muscle memory of how to, how to perform these skills. Uh, it's a great opportunity for them to ask questions and really you know, work through the techniques until they actually feel comfortable. Um, so because this was geared towards people with no healthcare background, we wanted to make sure that we were teaching, teaching this course. Um, while the content is geared toward people with no healthcare background, there are many you know, clinical concepts within the teaching, um, some uh, medical terminology. But we wanted to make sure that we were getting, getting this across in a way that people would understand. So um, we created a survey uh, with um, some questions about their prior experience, prior training in CPR, any other emergency training, um, whether they had responded to an emergency medical situation in the past, um, as well as their confidence levels in responding to medical emergencies, stopping someone from bleeding, and then their confidence levels in doing things like wound packing and direct pressure. Um, and this is all before the course. We then resurveyed everybody after the course to find out whether their confidence levels in these techniques would improve, and also asked a few questions just generally about um, how the class was taught, whether they uh, understood everything, um, and also whether they would be comfortable teaching these uh, skills that they learned to other people. So when we implemented this training program, um, it really, in our hospital, was primarily a nursing initiative. We had a few, uh, a few of our nurses took a class at a conference, brought it back to our hospital, asked for a little bit of funding to buy a few kits, and just went from there. Um, we piloted it. Our, our first class was actually for the security uh, officers in the hospital. Um, the reason we chose them was that we felt that if there were an emergency within the hospital, in, an, in a non-patient care area, they would likely be the first people to respond. So in any of the construction areas or just you know, where there are no medical personnel readily available. So we felt like these would be really useful skills for them to have. And it was very well received by them. We then wanted to build up our training pool. Um, so we held many train the trainer classes within the hospital for our doctors, our nurses, our PAs, NPs um, to get a bigger group of people to help us go out and teach these things in the community. Uh, we had a, a table at the local street fair um, where we spread awareness of the, of the campaign and what we were doing and tried to gain interest from the community members. We actually developed a relationship with the um, 19th precinct, which is our local police precinct, um, and have started to do a little bit of work with them through their community outreach. Um, and then we took our trainings uh, a little bit on a larger scale out into the community. So we went to a few private institutions to do larger trainings. We had in-hospital trainings for community members. Um, really just tried to, tried to find people who were interested in taking it wherever we could. So to date, we've trained um, 650 members of our community. Um, and we've also trained uh, over 300 trainers, both within our institution and at other institutions. Um, so anybody can be a trainer who's taken the course and is a medical provider or nurse. Um, so um, you can see that our level of nursing involvement is pretty significant. Um, from the beginning, we've done all the organizational um, planning, structuring, enrollment of participants, training the trainers, um, collection of data, development of the survey that we used. So um, we had 93% of our classes were actually taught, the lecture portion of the class was taught by a nurse. And at every single one of our trainings, we had at least one nurse present doing um, the skill station training. Um, so our results of our survey um, were overwhelmingly positive. Um, we found a big increase in most people's confidence levels in the various skills um, related to hemorrhage control, um, increased confidence to respond to medical emergencies, increased confidence in their ability to stop someone from bleeding. Um, most of the people who took it taught, thought that the course was taught in terms that were easy to understand. And um, what I think is you know, sort of important on this slide is that 95% of people said that they would be somewhat or extremely confident teaching other people what they had learned. Um, now this doesn't mean to say that they would be comfortable standing in front of a group and if it, giving the whole presentation, but were they able to pass along, would they be able to pass along those skills that they've learned and just show someone else how to do it? And a lot of people felt that they could. Um, we haven't resurveyed anyone because of the, the size of the, you know, the groups that we've trained um, and sort of the, you know, they're, they're from multiple locations and we just don't have any follow-up 
um, from that. But this is immediately after the course was taken, they gave this feedback. So the challenges that we faced in our hospital, this is um, a fully volunteer um, endeavor. So it's always hard to, to get people to come in. And you know we've trained mostly um, doctors and nurses who work in the hospital. So it's hard to get people to be available in, during the week. It's hard to get people to want to give up their free time on their weekends and nights. And um, so it's been a little bit difficult to staff these events on the scale that we want to. Um, enrolling participants. Um, uh, in some cases, it's very easy if you do it in the middle of the day at, at a you know, law firm and they have people on their lunch break come and sit through the class. Um, on the other hand, it's harder to get community members to come into the hospital on an evening or um, you know, during the day to, to take the course. And we also noticed a lot of hesitancy on the part of community members um, to participate in a class that addresses such um, distressing and emotionally charged content. Um, graphic material. A lot of people were afraid to, you know, to participate in something like that. Um, that being said, there were a, a number of people who came up to us or emailed us after the courses saying, you know, I'm really surprised how, how okay I am with this whole idea and how I think that I actually would be able to respond. I never thought I'd be able to. I'm really squeamish, but now I think that I could manage to do this in an emergency situation. So um, lack of funding for a volunteer um, you know, community outreach initiative is always difficult. Um, and then the huge, the huge administrative commitment that there is. Again, this is all volunteer. And so for the, um, for the couple of us that were sort of really in charge of running this program, that's an extra you know, many, many number of hours on top of actually doing the trainings, which is the part that we really love to do. But that was, that was one of our biggest challenges. So um, overall, a very, very well received, um, received course. Um, people definitely showed that they were more confident. They did um, successfully learn the material. Um, and uh, because nurses do so much communication, so much education as a part of our jobs, we really felt that we were well equipped to translate that into teaching community members who don't have a healthcare background these you know, healthcare related topics. Um, so. Um, our goals for the program are just to, to train as many people as we can. We want to go out into the communities, we want to go into stadiums and, and concert venues and really anywhere we can go to train as many people as we can because the more people that know this, you know, the more likelihood there is of at some event maybe the person standing next to you knows how to stop bleeding and, and can help that person get to the hospital alive. Um, we've started working with other institutions a little bit to try to develop their programs and sharing our experiences and our um, you know, infrastructure. Um, and we've also started collaborating a little bit with, um, with other institutions and using, you know, doing trainings together and pooling resources. So um, that's going to be very necessary if we do these really large scale trainings. So um, this is one of our youngest uh, students here, so it's my kids love to do this. They think it's, you know, great and interesting. So uh, anybody can do this. It's really great. So these are everybody who worked on our project. Any questions? Yeah, so we've actually, um, we've been uh, sort of communicating with some um, uh, school boards in the city and I've been in touch a little bit with this, my, my own kids' school district. Um, there's a little bit of a roadblock in terms of, you know, these are minors and so what can you teach to them? I offered to my kids' school to teach the teachers. So we'd come in, we'd teach all the teachers and the, you know, the school staff, um, but there was some, you know, contract that they have with school safety you know, someone or other. Um, so there's a little bit of difficulty with that, but we have gone into, we went to Barnard, we spoke to, uh, we taught a group of, of students at Barnard College and um, a few other uh, places like that. So we're, we're working on trying to get into more, definitely more institutions like that, so. Any other questions? Thank Great, you. thank you.
Okay. And you can place this in your pocket. Okay. Where can you can put that in the do you have a pocket? The pocket here. No, it's closed. Okay. You don't want to hold the bullet this, yeah. this is for the. Uh, uh, you need it. Okay. So, um, let me, I'll give you a stand. It's okay. Thank you very much. Tejera. 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 Okay. Uh, our next speaker is uh, from Brazil, Silvana. Tejera, Del Ponte. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm emergency physician in Porto Alegre. That is the capital of the southernmost state in Brazil that is called Rio Grande do Sul. And it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about Suture Course, Experience Report and Analysis of Utilization. Medical Students of Trauma and Emergence League of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul realized that the medical course has some deficiencies in its teaching, especially related to practical activities. Um, the suture technique, uh, technique, for example, is only taught in the seventh semester uh, of college in just one practical class. So uh, then this league, this uh, emergence, trauma and emergency league of this university and the plastic surgery league of the same university uh, in order to, uh, oh, sorry, academic centers uh, decide to take a theoretical and practical course on techniques of suture that every doctor should know how to do when leaving college. In Brazil, we already uh, start working as soon as we finish six years of medical college, which exposes us to situations uh, that we need to know how to suture, for example, as soon as we graduate. So, first, the students have a theoretical class um, on the most basic surgery techniques of suture. And here is the material, uh, a part of the material that the students receive before the course, uh, for teaching the simple stitch uh, of suture and the Donati, we call Donati. And here, another uh, part of the material that the students receive for the course, uh, the subdermal and intradermal stitches. And then the practical part of the course was taught by Trauma and Emergency League's monitors and by the Plastic, plastic Surgery League of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul monitors, which were previously training for this. So here the technique uh, were taught in ox tongues, a material closer to hum reality in relation to human skin. And uh, the students uh, were asked to answer some questions before and after the course. Here is uh, some questions in Portuguese, but I will present the results for you in English. <laughs> and then 82% of the students were from Fe Univers Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. There is another three uh, universities. And uh, the average age wa of, uh, was 
22 years old and being the majority of 50th semester. 46% here you can see 46 percent has previously taken course like this and made, when they were asked about importance of knowing future on a scale of uh, 0 to 10 the minimum was 9 but the technique approach in college was 2 and before course only 25 percent um, of participants felt able of for future and after course 79 percent felt able you can see here before course and after course so it's great for us And so, uh, to conclusion, in conclusion, there is a considerable deficiency in teaching of future techniques, uh, techniques in undergraduate medicine. And a theoretical practical course proved to be a good strategy to increase students' knowledge. Uh, this future course is just an example of uh, practical activities that we can teach for, in, uh, for our students in college. Uh, they need more practical uh, activities. They learn a lot with it. And thank you. If I can't answer your um, questions, you can send me an email. It's here. Thank you very much for your attention. just one class in this practical activities on future and this league is from our federal university it's our university that I okay, so it's at the federal university yeah thank you, thank you. Um, so you said you used the big palm cow tongue of the surgery for the some, yeah. model that's what you use yeah okay uh, have you ever used pig speak? Did you find that the bees come and dead end pig speak? Because I run a couple of future courses here and we've been using pig speak. I would be interested to know if cow tongue is more like human stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and the, que the question is, is have you used uh, pig speak? It's yeah. an ox tongue. Uh, ox tongue. Yeah. Bovin song. Yeah. Yeah. No, but did you ever use it? Uh, um, yes, but not in this time, this course. Did you like the, the, the cow tongue? Is yeah. It Is it like human? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I didn't understand the question. Is, is the, the tongue that you yeah. use very similar to when you do it on the human? Yeah. It's the same? Not the well, same, yeah. but close. <laughs> I think it's hard, a little bit hard. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Halpern, who's coming, us for, coming to us from Israel. He's going to speak on six hours of mechanical ventilation is feasible. Thank you very much. Um, this is the um, hospital I come from. It's a um, Tel Aviv downtown um, university hospital. And we've seen our share of major disasters there. We've treated many, many mass casualty incidents, unfortunately. That's why our interest in the topic is very significant. Um, manual ventilation within Ammo bag, so called, is a basic skill that all of us learn and all, most of us at least practice. Um, 
We practice this though for seconds or minutes after we've intubated the patient mostly, or in between when we transfer patients and so on. It's a skill, but it's also an effort. It's something we actually physically have to do with our hands. Uh, so it's usually restricted to very short periods of time. And um, there's another issue, which is the fact that surge capacity is at the core of preparedness for disasters. One of the assumptions in major disasters is that there might be large numbers of persons who require mechanical ventilation, far outstripping our ability to provide that with mechanical ventilators, which are usually mostly in use at all times. There may be a surge capacity in some countries, such as this country, but it's not immediate. It usually takes hours to days to provide that capacity uh, to the place where it's needed. So the alternative to that might be manual mechanical ventilation, which is in fact uh, practiced in some third world countries or underdeveloped countries because of the lack of mechanical ventilators without disasters on a daily basis. So we set out to study that uh, assumption that we can in fact ventilate manually for prolonged periods of time, which is in our standard operating procedure. That's what our disaster plans called for. Um, but nobody has ever, ever at least published a study that shows that is this, this is in fact feasible. So our first objective was to test the assumption that we can in fact do that. Man, uh, physically speaking, we can ventilate for hours on end, uh, bag to tube. And the other was, if we are going to be able to ventilate that long, what will be the quality of the ventilation we provide? It's not a mechanical ventilator, it is a human person in the end. So we took 10 nurses, fairly young, who volunteered to, to ventilate a mechanical um, device which we use in our respiratory therapy to test our mechanical ventilator. It's a so-called test lung. And it does record volume and rate. Um, and uh, they just sat comfortably on a chair and the device was placed at a height which is uh, the same as an ER gurney and they um, would ventilate any way they were pleased. They would told them to ventilate the, the way they would do it on a regular shift, basically. So uh, the study was very simple, although it took a while to set up. But basically we asked three questions. How difficult is it for you? And we tested that uh, on a so-called Bohr scale, which is commonly used to test for um, subjective perceived effort. And we found that, in fact, the effort was very, very low because a 6 to 10 value on a Bohr scale uh, corresponds with very light and fairly light effort. So none of them actually thought it was very hard. And uh, when we looked at the blood pressure and heart rate and respiratory rate and saturation, they were all within normal limits, indicating uh, also, uh, objectively, that the effort they were uh, undergoing was really not uh, very significant. And then we looked at the quality of ventilation they were providing, and they were providing a tidal volume of about 500 to 600, 600 ml, and the average minute volume varied from 7 to about 11 liters per minute. Now, this is significant variation, but it's still within very acceptable clinical levels and the average respiratory rate that did increase somewhat during the experiment from about 12 to about 17 breaths per minute, still within acceptable clinical ranges. If we look at that uh, graphically, the Bohr scale was fairly stable and you can see that this is a very light amount of, of subjective effort and uh, the uh, tidal volume was fairly stable a long time. It did vary of course, but it was stable on the average as was the respiratory rate delivered, although it increased slightly, and as was the minute volume which increased because of the increase in respiratory rate. So the bottom line is that if we assume in our standard operating procedure that we may need to ventilate large numbers of patients in a disaster situation, a surge situation, by using humans who can then intubate the patient and manually ventilate them with a bag valve device, this seems to be feasible. It's physically not very taxing. It's totally acceptable in as far as the quality of ventilation that's being provided. And it can be done for at least six hours. 
and probably for much longer. And I, the major limitation that the nurses who did the study perceived was boredom, basically. So uh, they, after the second experiment, we provided them with a TV screen that they could somewhat look at. We didn't want them to do that too much because um, it may affect the quality, but as you could see, it did not really affect the quality of ventilation much. We are now doing a second study, which is um, looking at using less highly trained caregivers, not nurses necessarily, but rather um, radiology technicians, physical therapists, and lab technicians, people who in a disaster will not really have much of a role in the management of the disaster and will therefore be much more available uh, in a real life situation. The nurses will be, will be naturally very, very busy in a disaster situation. And we hope to see the same quality of ventilation um, that we saw with the nurses. So, thank you very much. We actually have a long-standing project uh, that looked at that and it has failed. It has failed not because of physiology but because of logistics. Okay. And the feeling is that it's so much more complex than actually having three, four or 30 caregivers each ventilating one person because you have to mobilize, you have to transport these patients. So they may be together for five minutes and then one goes this way, the other goes the other way. So what do you do then? And the other thing we're looking at is different uh, resistances and compliances on the test lung to see if this will work for patients with severe ARDS, right. where the work may be harder. Yes, please. Thank you. As the time went by, did you look at maybe, or maybe it's worth looking at, different ratios, say, between tile volumes or minute ventilation and the, the effort, the board scale? We did. The effort did not change across time. But there was some idea that was a little dim and then went back up. Did you notice any ratios that were kind of constant during that time? We did look at that and uh, the uh, ratio where the changes were minimal and they were within very acceptable level. None of them complained at all. All felt, in the end, when we asked them, all felt that it was not really a very uh, difficult task. We did not specifically compare that, but we did allow them to switch hands, to use one hand, two hands, hand over thigh, all the techniques that we all use, uh, and we, that just allowed them to vary, and that probably also uh, decreased the effort because they were using different muscle groups throughout the time. Yes, please. No. Why? Well, it's a machine, so there's no entitled CO2. But, uh, or, like, did they have any idea how much volume? No. They were blinded to the, um, thank you for the question. It's a good one, we, because we had, we had a big debate about whether we should, and the answer is no. They did not have feedback. It would have been too easy, because they could have then aimed, just aimed at the tidal volume. Normally, you would see an entitled CO2, maybe, but the, it, I don't think there are BVMs that actually have a uh, tidal volume monitor. Yeah. That's not common. Sorry? Do they even have a clock? Uh, no. Uh, the third study, which is already being planned, will be one where we'll compare ventilating with a metronome and without a metronome. We'll add a metronome to the ventilation to see if it prevents that creep up in the respiratory rate. Oh, they would get, if required, they would get a five minute break um, every hour or two hours based on requirement. And so that was allowed during the study? As yes, well. it was. Okay. Thank you very much. I Thank have you. A uh, have you considered using a pediatric BVM for this? We did. We have not done the study as yet. You're correct. It should be done. Uh, my guess it will, is that the ver relative variation in volume will be much greater because it will be much more difficult to maintain 50 cc as opposed to 100 
um, versus 500 as opposed to 550. Yeah, the military is doing a lot of work with that because you can carry a pediatric BBM in your bag a little bit easier sure. for a slight bit of space. And if you have somebody with injured lungs, it's easier to keep within the five to seven it's recommended sure. by You just have to increase that. the rate. Because our BBMs are, are large for pediatrics and they're sure. large for adults, so there's a lot of extra space. Sure. So you can actually downsize and still... There's actually BBMs, yeah. which I, I think are 800 cc coming on market now. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker comes from uh, Temple University, uh, Joe Corcoran. All right, hi everybody. Um, as he said, I'm, my name is Joe Corcoran. I'm a second year medical student at Temple University. Today I'm gonna be having a conversation with you about some of the challenges faced by post-disaster communities using Puerto Rico after Hurricanes Maria and Irma as a case study. Uh, I'm a medical student, so I have nothing to disclose. I'm a member of a student group called TEEK, the Temple Emergency Action Corps. This is a group that trains students to respond to disasters both at home and abroad. Every spring, TEEK goes on a service trip to a different disaster, uh, post-disaster location. And so this March, we went to Puerto Rico with 15 medical students, 15 medical students, and four physicians. Um, and I wanna talk to you a little bit about the work we did there. So many of you know this is Puerto Rico. It's an unincorporated US territory, home to 3.4 million US citizens. Now on September 6th of last year, Hurricane Irma, category five storm, swept past the northern coast, left about a million individuals without power. Before the repairs from that storm were complete, two weeks later, Hurricane Maria took a course right across the island. Now the day after Maria, roughly 95% of the power grid was down in Puerto Rico. Approximately 50% of the residents did not have power. I wanna talk a little bit about the response to that because I think the way we improve responses is by talking about what worked, what didn't work, and how we can improve that for the future. So mostly the response from FEMA, the acute response was focused on life-saving measures, kind of the bottom half of Maslow's hierarchy of needs minus the bit about self-actualization. So that means restoring food, providing fresh water, trying to establish shelter, trying to restore electricity. With limited supplies and limited manpower and a limited amount of time, these are, I think, the things that you wanna be focused on, but it does leave a gap in certain areas, and mental health is the one I want to talk about today. Mental health, compared to things like starvation, infection, broken bones, might not be considered quite as acute, but potentially it could be just as deadly. Now, mental health is often not addressed in disaster scenarios. And so I want to, you know, this presentation is about Teek's efforts to run a student-run relief program that focused on mental health. There's at least two weird things in that sentence. One is focusing on mental health after disasters. As I said, it doesn't tend to be done. There's not usually enough hands on deck, and so it gets pushed in the priority list um, to kind of uh, after the acute response period. Uh, but we know for a fact that Puerto Rico's government was reporting spikes in depression and suicide rates after the storm. The other aspect is that student-run relief programs are pretty uncommon. And there's a variety of reasons for this, but if you have limited resources, you want the people who are distributing those resources to be well-trained. You don't want them necessarily learning on the job. So we got to thinking, what if we take this guy or gal, that's a student, and use them to address this stuff? So let's think about it. To address mental health after a disaster, you need to be able to take a history, you need to be able to listen, empathizing is critical, and then reporting to a physician. So medical students, can do all of these things. So this factored into our approach. We collaborated with local physicians and social workers to identify towns that were one, had high need, and two, where we could establish continuity of care. And then we used our student, translator, physician teams to really tackle mental health issues with the patients uh, who we identified as needing that care. Given the lack of focus on mental health in the time since the disasters, we we're hypothesizing that there would be elevated rates of depression and suicidal thoughts even when we got to Puerto Rico, which was at the end of March, so 200 days after Hurricane Irma. Now to test this hypothesis, we needed a broad, array, a broad array 
um, of patients. And so we advertised. Uh, we advertised our clinics a lot using a whole variety of methods here. As you can see, radio was our most efficient way of spreading the word. Each of the patients who did come in filled out a standardized patient interview form, which included validated screenings, the same ones you'd use in most EDs uh, for depression and suicidal risk. And then we conducted an IRB exempt chart review of that data. So 200 days after, per, after Hurricane Irma, what did we see? Well, out of 587 patients that we had complete charts on, over 5% still had no access to fresh drinking water. Over a quarter did not have electricity. Nearly 20% uh, were clinically depressed on our scale, which is up from about 9.6% before the storm, and over 10% were at risk of suicide, up from less than 5% before the storm. So this gives you the picture of all the patients we see. I'm going to break this down a little bit by town, because I think it gives you a more compelling and complex story, but also a little bit more honest one, and kind of an idea of why a one-size-fits-all disaster response plan might not be so effective. Here in the black columns, we have the levels of depression, and in the blue, levels of suicide, uh, of suicidal thoughts and tendencies. So you can see in this, uh, the two columns closest to me, those are our pre-storm levels across the entire island. Now, one immediate takeaway is that each of these different towns, the depression rate is still uh, above what it was, above what the island's pre-storm rate was. But something else to bear in mind is that while the actual recovery is not complete, towns have different levels of recovery shown here. So if we take a look at Patias, at this one in the middle. What that column is showing is that 29.6, so roughly 3 in 10 adults in that town are clinically depressed based on our scale, uh, based on PHQ-9, which is a pretty accepted scale. With each patient who came in, we also asked, is your water back? How about your electricity? When did those come back online? And bear in mind that 25% of our patients did not have their power back, uh, and 5% did not have their water. So the reality is that many of these uh, points are likely shifted even further uh, back in time. But what this does show you is that this, the one-size-fits-all response results in, you know, some communities lagging behind. So Yavakoa, shown here in the yellow, uh, had their water restored in the middle of November. Power wasn't restored for the majority of people. Uh, on average, it was restored in uh, late February. So once again, this shows kind of a differential recovery based on uh, the relief efforts. So kind of wrapping this up, I want to talk a little bit about the impact. Um, I think this hopefully opens the door uh, for a focus on mental health, both an acute focus and a more long-term plan. And we talked a little bit about how mental health, when put with things like broken bones and infection, uh, might not be as acute. But clearly, uh, it can be deadly, and it can lead to an epidemic. Um, and so it does need to be addressed and there do need to be plans to address that in the response planning. Um, and the other thing is kind of, you know, unlike those gloves at the hardware store, one size doesn't fit all in this case. So we need to think about ways to individualize response plans for different communities. Now, the steps we've taken so far to do this uh, in different locations, in Puerto Rico we've tried to kind of disseminate our results, share things with uh, the local leaders in Patias, for instance, saying, you know, based on the patients who we saw in clinic, three in 10 of them may be suffering from post-disaster depression. Sometimes having those numbers gives community leaders the power to actually do something about that and to get the resources from the federal or state or territory government to do something about that. In Philadelphia, uh, my colleague Janie Swiatek and I, have, we, we met with the Philadelphia Mayor's Department to address, to discuss uh, some of the Puerto Rican refugees who are displaced to Philadelphia, what their needs might be how those match up with the needs that we saw in Puerto Rico and what we can anticipate for long-term recovery on their parts. And then the aspect of today, which I think is the most important aspect of this, um, which is just that reminding everybody here that disasters don't go away after six and a half months. Um, and I think with our news cycle and with everything else, we have a tendency after things fall out of the news to stop thinking about them. Um, but I really want to encourage everybody to keep disaster relief and the special aspect of it that mental health plays in the forefront of our thoughts, conversations, and ideally research moving forward. Uh, lots of people to thank, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
for sure. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. So when we were selecting our towns, we held clinics in five main towns, and we chose those based on the need towns. Uh, the towns marked here. So towns right where the hurricane had passed through, um, and towns that hadn't received a lot of aid. So these data, I would say, we believe to be representative of uh, the Puerto Ricans who were badly affected by the disaster. I would not go so far to say that it reflects all of Puerto Rico. Um, but I thank you for making me clarify that. Did you try to correlate the physical shape, the tower uh, wall in with the ratio of uh, the pressure and the disaster? The physical shape of the town itself? Yes. Uh, we didn't. We didn't have any way to measure that specifically. Like the percent of people without water, without electricity? Yeah. So one interesting correlation that we found that we are still looking into um, was a correlation between uh, I want to make sure I word this correctly. Patients who uh, were depressed, their power came on, or their water was restored significantly more slowly than patients without depression. And we can't comment on that exactly because we don't have pre-storm depression levels for each of those patients. Um, but that was something that stood out that we wanted to kind of look upon more. There wasn't any correlation with electricity. Um, between electricity and depression, or electricity and suicidal thoughts. Um, I just want to thank you for your work. Uh, coming from close Katrina New Orleans, where we still feel that impact of mm -hmm. health and mental health and how that interplay goes on over time. So keep up this work. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you for having me. on mental health and TBI in Tanzania. Okay. Thank you for having me here to speak with you all today. I'm Elizabeth Canales, a third year medical student at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. I work with Dr. Catherine Stanton and our team at Duke University, in addition to our team in Motion Tanzania as well. And we will be talking about mental health epidemiology of traumatic brain injury patients in Moshi Tanzania. There are no financial disclosures. So globally, traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is the most common cause of injury-related morbidity and mortality with a greater impact in low- and middle-income countries. The reason for this greater impact and the greater burden in low middle income countries is due to, in part, the increased risk factor prevalence and also um, the increased burden on the financial systems who aren't able to um, immediately respond to this injury. TBI severity and clinical characteristics are influenced by pr uh, patients' pre-injury mental health. Studies have shown that psychiatric illness is a risk factor for TBI, and not only that, but greater severity of psychiatric illness is also correlated with increased risk of TBI. On top of that, <clears throat> a history of substance abuse has also been shown to have an increased risk of TBI as well, particularly alcohol use. Despite all this literature, there is limited information on the relationship between psychological factors and TBI clinical characteristics, particularly in low and middle income countries. And for that reason, there is an incomplete understanding of the true epidemiological scope of the problem. Therefore, we aim to describe the mental health, functionality, and socio-demographics of TBI patients in Moshi, Tanzania in order to improve the care of TBI patients in this population. 214 patients from a TBI registry in Moshi, Tanzania were recruited from the emergency department of a TBI registry in um, the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center serves as a teaching and referral hospital in Moshi, which is a town in the, region of the, of, in the Kilimanjaro region of northern Tanzania. The patients were evaluated using seven instruments shown in table one, 
uh, these instruments have been previously validated or are currently being validated in this setting. Pre-injury scales will result, um, pr the pre-injury scale results will serve as a baseline for future follow-up evaluations in this population. So the majority of TBI patients sustained a mild TBI with median Glasgow comma scale of 15 and had a formal education <coughs> were employed married males with a median age of 29 years. Most of the patients suffered a mild TBI because these patients were the ones that were able to respond to the psychological tests in the study. Therefore, the focus is on mild TBI rather than the full spectrum of TBI disease. 22% of patients were identified with a high hazardous alcohol use, 81% with cognitive impairment, and there was an overall low incidence of depression of 1.4% and psychological distress of 0.5%. This study has a few important limitations. First, there was a high incidence of 81% of cognitive impairment that likely reflects a, an acute injury response rather than pre-injury functioning. One of the possible explanations for this is that the scale used for this uh, to measure cognitive impairment is still being validated in this setting by a current study. Second, th there was the assumption that patients' cognitive functioning at the time of the injury was sufficient to accurately respond to, these ba to this battery of psychological tests. And we compensated for this by requiring decision-making capacity for enrollment and all of our patients had sustained only mild injury. However, patients were still limited post-injury, so baseline results may still be contaminated. Third was the assumption that patients will not have significant worsening of baseline depression and anxiety baseline scales after recently experiencing a, a traumatic event. And this again was compensated for by specifically asking about pre-injury functioning. So prior to injury, several mild TBI patients demonstrated harmful alcohol use without depression or psychological distress. So therefore, there may not be a relationship between pre-injury depression and psychological distress with risk of mild TBI in the Tanzanian population. This, however, contrasts from previous literature, which has shown that major depressive and anxiety and other psychiatric illness is correlated with increased risk of TBI. Another explanation for the low incidence of depression and psychological distress, however, may be due to the use of alcohol as a self-treatment mechanism in order to cope with these depressive or anxiety symptoms. So this suggests that alcohol may be the linking factor between functionality with depression and psychological distress that allows for the patients to cope with their potentially undiagnosed symptoms. So overall, it is essential to further understand these comorbidities and their contribution to TBI risk in order to ultimately improve the care of TBI patients in Tanzania. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, of course, just baseline results from asking about pre-injury functioning, and right now we're following up with them at three months, six months, and then I believe nine months again, which is currently, I think we have the data already on three months and six months, but we haven't analyzed it or looked at it quite yet. Yeah. Were you able to enroll those with more severe TBI? So we focused only on mild TBI for that reason, because there were you know, seven instruments that we used, there was a lot of questions, we had to translate it to Swahili and all of that kind of stuff. So. Right now, the focus is on mild TBI, um, but if we can extend it somehow to include moderate and severe TBI, you know, that would be ideal. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what we're thinking, you know, for maybe future research and future literature studies to look at, to see if maybe alcohol is the reason why they're not, um, you know, disclosing or, uh, like you said, some other cultural factors for why they wouldn't be disclosing depression and anxiety symptoms. But it hasn't really been looked at so far. Thomas here?
University Health Network. Forward, back. What's the laser pointer again? Just this here. Is this anything? No, this one right here. Okay. Is this oh, oh this is just braille. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Our next speaker is Thomas Voida from uh, St. Luke's University Health Network. Good afternoon. Thank you to Akame for. Uh, putting this on. This conference is fantastic and it's only growing and getting better. Uh, my name is Thomas Voida. This is my uh, report on perceived barriers to implementation of QI initiatives in the outpatient setting. Implications for international academic programs. I have no disclosures. Um, ambulatory care clinics are uh, continuing to adopt QI initiatives more and more. However, um, little is known about implementation barriers. Uh, certain initiatives have been you know, minimizing uh, patient no-shows, enhancing patient satisfaction, women's health initiatives, optimizing workflows and expanding preventative care services. Our aim is to describe the differences in the perceptions of potential barriers to QI improvement projects in the ambulatory care. Our hypothesis is that there's no difference between the categories of perceived barriers to implementation of QI projects. Um, so the metho methodology is residency programs of our community-based academically affiliated health network were surveyed. Um, participant demographics included the hospital and specialty. Uh, if they were an attending or a resident, their year of residency and whether or not they were pursuing or planning on pursuing a fellowship. A five-point Likert scale was used to assess the differences between a resident and attending physician perceptions on potential barriers to quality improvement in implementation. A survey which isn't shown was modified from a prior ambulatory care clinic report uh, based out of Scotland. First, we uh, assessed resident QI knowledge, basic QI knowledge, how knowledgeable they were about QI initiatives. Then we asked them a series of questions related to cost, uh, involvement, uh, ancillary staff, time, uh, benefit, whether the program was meeting their needs, uh, whether patient load had anything to do with their ability to do QI projects, uh, whether a potential loss of income might uh, inhibit them from pursuing QI projects, as well as how much guidance that they were given. After that, they were given a list of questions related to how much they agreed or disagreed with uh, a potential statement. So one might be like, I actively am involved in the design and implementation of a QI initiative. And then on a scale of one to five, strongly agree versus disagree and three being unsure, they wrote down um, what level they were at. Uh, statistical analysis was performed using uh, SPSS. Sample size was calculated using Rousoft, uh, online sample size calculator. Uh, 50 responses were uh, needed for a difference with alpha of 0.05 and chi-square test was performed. Variables were examined. We did um, people pursuing a fellowship versus not pursuing a fellowship, whether they were part of a surgical uh, special specialty versus non-surgical, and their experience. And we grouped PGY1 and 2 versus PGY3 and up. Uh, and then we grouped the Likert scale scores together. So agree and disagree, four and five, were grouped together. Unsure, disagree, and strongly disagree were grouped together. Uh, 72 surveys were collected. We used REDCap online uh, electronic data storage to collect these. 60 residents, 12 attending physicians uh, reported back. These are the frequencies, as well as 35 of 60 residents planned on or were going into a fellowship versus 25 of 60 who are not. Uh, this is just a breakdown by specialty. Uh, our university health network currently has uh, four family medicine primary care uh, residency programs. Only three were uh, included in this because the fourth just started about a month ago. Um, and so this is just the breakdown here. 
Um, this is just uh, a breakdown on knowledge difference of QI implementation. As you can see, uh, PGY1 and 2 uh, showed a significant difference in that they did not have as much QI knowledge compared to PGY3s and ups. Um, this is just a perception of barriers. Other than uh, ancillary, anc ancillary staff involvement, uh, no other differences were deemed uh, significant. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these different results and how they apply to the ambulatory clinic in just a second. Uh, as well as in pursuing fellowship, QI education, as well as adequate technology were uh, deemed significant. Uh, surgical specialties for non-surgical ideas sought to improve care, as well as receiving adequate technology were deemed significant. And then uh, a resident's perception on uh, how, how much they play a role in the design of a study, PGY ones and twos versus PGY three and above showed a difference. So if you take a look at here, these are all the significant variables involved. And I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about, you know, something I saw in the ambulatory clinic where I'm a PGY one right now and kind of how this all relates together. So we do a colorectal cancer screening uh, health network wide for, um, to, to get people referrals for, um, for uh, colonoscopy. Because as everybody knows, if you diagnose stage one or two, you have better outcomes than if it's stage three or four. So the quicker that you can diagnose somebody with a malignant or possible transformation, the quicker that they can get um, surgical care and the better their outcomes will be. So we had a PGY3 doing this project who was not interested really in pursuing a fellowship. Um, and what we found, and in addition to that, what we found is with our, with our program, what we do when we write referrals is we just refer for gastroenterology and we put in refer for colonoscopy written. But when we, were, when we were doing like the network wide looking at our results, the people that were abstracting the data from our EMR, they were just looking for refer for colonoscopy at the other ones. So our results were super low. So you have this person who isn't really interested in doing QI, who's getting results back saying we aren't screening the way we should. And so he spends a lot of his free time looking more in depth to say, hey, we are actually screening. So you can imagine there's some frustration involved in this um, because he's spending a lot of his excess time doing something that he hoped that the ancillary staff support would do. And you know, this, this actually does have implications in practice is, you know, just last week, we had a, a woman with, you know, stage four colon cancer who was in because she had an obstruction due to you know, chemo radiation therapy and colectomy, and she was in, we had to treat her for a week uh, because she didn't have a bowel movement. So you know, I'm not saying in this case, the reason why you know, she had stage four was because we didn't catch her quick enough when she had stage one, but you can imagine with the amount of referrals you do and the prevalence of colon cancer in society that you know, this could make a huge difference you know, in practice. So. Um, long story short, it's really important to identify certain perceptions of barriers. It can be a huge time saver as well as, you know, you can get, you can get people involved early in QI initiative projects or as well as research projects and you can not only save time when you're doing this, but it's a cost effective way of um, optimizing ambulatory uh, care clinics to provide more uh, cost effective care. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I will take any questions. <laughs> I, I have a quick question. Um, it, it sounds like a lot of the projects that we see from international uh, endeavors uh, are descriptive. And I think what you, know, what you have demonstrated here is that uh, not only can, can quality improvement be another way to engage, not necessarily in research up front, but in improving the way you deliver care, but also how knowing how you approach QI can improve the way you do QI. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's a huge opportunity on the internet.
international scale, when these programs exist throughout the world, mm -hmm. to actually do QI projects and not simply describe how many patients someone has seen in the last six months and what, what, you know, what is the demographic breakdown of that population. I mean, that's kind of a big, you know, cliche. But um, I, I, think, I think this is an important avenue where we can transition from descriptive to QI and then evolve into research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a big reason why I kind of wanted to focus on this was just the frustration of some of the residents and the attendings that in our clinic is we had all these good ideas of how to increase vaccination rates, increase screening rates for uh, preventable you know, cervical cancer with HPV vaccines. And we had all these really good ideas, but you know, the implementation just was never quite there. So even though we would get data and we would get something out of it, there was just like a lot more left to be desired. So I think that you know, pinpointing you know, even more specific barriers and getting in early and identifying them is really cost effective. And it's, it's not, you just save, you save a lot of time and you can save a lot of money and effort by you know, doing a little bit more uh, scientific or scientifically rigorous uh, measurement of these things as opposed to, you know, here's what we did kind of thing. Although that is important as well, you know, everything helps. So any more questions? Okay, thank you all. Don't go away. We will be having um, snacks in a little bit, but I, um, I, I there's a couple of things. Oh, there's one more. Awesome. It's where? Yes. And that's the correct one? The Cotsville. And where are you from? Uh, St. Luke's. St. Luke's, okay. And which is your slide? Uh, it's in the USB. Um, which USB? It's the one that he just put in. Oh, um, I gave him back his. Uh, oh, he has it too? Okay, our uh, next speaker is Vika Yalapu, from, also from uh, St. Luke's. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Vikas. So today I'm going to be talking about medical demographics in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we looked at the temporal trends in the emergency medicine department visits among elderly patients. I have no disclosures. So we know at this point that the life expectancy throughout the world has been increasing rapidly since 2000. Uh, roughly the world's change is about 5.5 years. The main point here is that in African countries we see an increase of 10.4 years. And so the countries that with the greatest increases include Liberia, Ethiopia, and Rwanda, so specifically the sub-Saharan region. 
Uh, with this increase in life expectancy, we're starting to see a shift from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases and traumas as a cause of death in elderly patients. So our aim was to identify through published, uh, using published literature, we tried to identify uh, these demographic trends uh, in emergency departments across Sub-Saharan Africa as increases in life expectancy. And as a secondary aim, we tried to identify any comorbid conditions that have been increasing conditions in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the methods that we used, we looked through PubMed, Google Scholar, Embase, and BioLine International between the years of 1990 and 2018. We looked specifically for studies that looked at, that specified age demographics, that looked at patients admitted to the ED or hospital as cause of trauma. And we also looked at hospitals that were uh, located in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one issue that we faced was the definition of elderly in a lot of these studies was variant, but most of them were specified it as ha being older than 50 to 65 years of age. So w for the secondary point to measure comorbidities, we used uh, data from the World Health Organization and the Global Health Data Exchange, and we looked at data from 2005 to 2016. So our results, this is what we found from the 36 different studies in terms of the trend in life expectancy. So we saw that there was an increase to roughly about 12% in the amount of admissions of elderly patients. So of all 36 studies primarily came from the nine countries that are highlighted. Even though it's only nine, it represents roughly 60% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa. So here we see the proportion of elderly patients split up into five different years, uh, five years consecutively. So we saw that there is an overall 8.9% increase in the median proportion of elderly patients that, that between 1990 and 2018. So when we looked at the comorbid, comorbid conditions, we see that there's an increase in incidence of ischemic heart disease and cerebrovascular disease by roughly 20%. While these are not the major causes of death yet, it's still HIV, malaria, diarrheal diseases, and TB, the incidence rate is significantly increasing. So keeping that in mind, we need to we need to significantly increase the amount of education of, of treating complex geriatric patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. As of right now, there's only about 25% of the Sub-Saharan nations that have a geriatric specialty. So there needs to be more efforts made to increasing, uh, increasing education and increasing funding for these specialties in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I just have a general question. I guess, does Africa have a problem with polypharmacy like we do in the U.S. for older patients? Is that becoming, does anybody know? There's a fabulous session tomorrow afternoon all about that. I, I have to work tomorrow, I'm sorry. Venezuela, 
you could buy almost anything over the counter. And I would, people would bring in medicine and I would, they'd have chloramphenicol and things like that with them. So you do see it, but not as bad as in my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our judges. Um, um, and I'd just like to have everybody sort of come in the room a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of announcements now at the end of the day. Um, one of the things that I, was, I realized that a lot of people didn't understand was what is the consensus group meeting. And basically, um, at the last two of CAMES, we come up with a uh, concept of something that we think is very important, and then we uh, go about writing the framework for it and assign authors, and it's always published in iGEM in the following December. And so we will be doing that, and we're very, very anxious for everyone here, who's, whether you're a member or not, to please stay for that. It's a, it's a good kind of... Uh, brainstorming idea and looking at a lot of the things that we've heard today we draw from those kinds of concepts and come up with a paper last year we really looked in, and published about um, academicians receiving support and credit for the international work they do so to get away from the paradigm of you know publish teach treat the it does it doesn't have to be just in our own city so I want to really encourage you to do that uh, for those of you who are members, uh, Christina is sending out the um, voting. Please vote for the officers. Um, that closes tomorrow. Um, the uh, awards for the abstracts will be tomorrow at the closing ceremony, as well as the awards for posters. Those of you who have posters up now, and if you if you if you care about them, and sometimes I and I can promise I've thrown a few of mine in the trash in my life. Um, but, you know, please pick them up and because we're going to be replacing them with people who are presenting posters tomorrow. The per tomorrow, we'll, they'll also announce the, um, the poster uh, awards. And one is for the best overall and the other is for the most unique. The same for the orals. Um, please come to the reception tonight. We're really looking forward to meeting you and having some social. People have made a lot of good contacts and this is a time to really build some relationship that we can carry forward because we don't know when we're going to get to see you each other again. So, um, we're kind of a new organization. This is our third year, but um, we absolutely, without a doubt, would not exist without our founding president. Um, and. I, this is not an award that gets given every year, and it's not something that's on an ongoing basis. But, you know, it was an idea that um, Sagar and Stan came up with, and then Stan really took on the presidency, uh, being our first president. And it wasn't just <laughs> recruiting, and he put a lot of time and energy into it. And as my father always said, the only truly non-renewable resource that you have in your life is your time. So if you're going to give it to something, you really need to pay attention. And Stan absolutely gave it to a came. And I want to, I think as we finish this kind of a, a session about oral abstracts and research, and we look at doing our consensus statement, so much of this is around his vision and what he created. And I think that we are all just delighted to have him in our academic life, in our academic program, and I want to give this award to Stan Stawicki. break um, and then we're going to come back here at um, three uh, three uh, yeah we have a break now until about quarter to four we're going to come back here and we'll have our consensus meeting it's already quarter to four uh, how about four o'clock four o'clock so four o'clock and we'll will the consensus meeting I do not think it's going to go anywhere near to six probably it'll be 45 minutes but we want to give lots of time and so everybody can talk
will be landing at around 8 in the morning. It's a non-stop frequency or non-stop Thank you. 